In the summer of 1630, the cities of northern Germany were flooded by thousands of propaganda leaflets. They told terrifying tales of the Lion of Midnight, who would come from the north to judge the sinful and save the faithful. This propaganda was, most likely, drawing on an old biblical apocalypse narrative and was meant to portray the young and ambitious Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus as the long-awaited savior of German Protestants. And a savior they needed desperately. In 12 years of war, the German Protestants had not scored even one major victory. 17th century Europe was a superstitious place, and many fully believed in the stories promoted by the Swedish propaganda. The fact that Sweden, to most other Europeans, was largely an unknown land in Northern Europe didn't help. For Germans, it was remote, so far away to the north that many believed it was inhabited by somewhat barbarous people. The outlandish appearance of Scottish and Finnish troops in Swedish service would only underline these beliefs. Newspapers in Hamburg even reported about a contingent of ferocious Finns riding reindeer. The Finnish cavalry was known as Hakapels after their war cry Haka Pale, strike upon them. Gustavus exploited these popular superstitions by always appearing accompanied by a detachment of Finnish cavalry and the equally exotic Scottish infantry. Soon after the Swedish landing in the empire, Catholics all over Europe were even muttering that death and the devil themselves were walking among the Swedes. In some sense, this was actually true, as two Swedish officers were named Tot, an old German word for death, and Teufel, German for devil. As usual, reality looked very different from views fueled by propaganda. The Swedish army that landed on the German island Usedom numbered a mere 13,600 men. They now joined the 5,000 already present at Stralsund. An extensive recruitment campaign in the summer added 7,000 German mercenaries. This might seem like a lot, but the Swedes themselves estimated that they needed 75,000 men to conquer northern Germany. Moreover, out of these roughly 25,000, about one-third was sick. And to make matters worse, the Swedes lacked maps that extended beyond Saxony, and most Protestant German states didn't support Gustavus at that stage at all. He would need both money and a great military success to attract significant German support. Nonetheless, his invasion culminated in the most dramatic and controversial phase of the Thirty Years' War a phase usually referred to as the Swedish Intervention. It not only pitched the most famous commanders of the war against each other in several decisive battles, but also marks the moment in time when the war spilled out of Germany for good. Historical authenticity is not something that many games try to achieve these days. Enlisted, the sponsor of this video, is an exception here. And you can try it out for free. Enlisted is a World War II multiplayer shooter that immerses you in the period with authentic weapons, vehicles, outfits, squad gameplay and much more. While striving for authenticity, Enlisted manages to strike the right balance between fun gameplay and historical realism. So the gameplay experience remains dynamic and fast-paced. The two game features that I enjoy the most are its large scale, large battlefields with dozens of soldiers make the world much more believable and the customization. You can choose your weapons and change your other equipment such as medkits depending on how you advance your character. Customization in games just adds an interesting layer for me because I can create my own soldiers. For example, as an engineer you can construct buildings on the map such as sandbag fortifications or place anti-tank cannons in strategical locations. Join us on the battlefield in Enlisted on PC, Xbox Series X and S and PlayStation 5, as well as PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. When registering, please use our link in the description below. You not only get a free bonus including 3 days of premium time and several orders for troops and weapons, but also support our channel. Remember, Enlisted is free, so just try it out. Gustavus's landing didn't seem to concern Emperor Ferdinand II and other German leaders all that much, because initially Gustavus failed to attract a significant following. Sweden was just not seen as a great power and the German Protestant princes favored a peaceful solution with the Catholic Emperor. Despite the Swedish landing, the Catholic leadership decided at the Regensburg Electoral Congress in 1630, it was time to get rid of the imperial commander Wallenstein. For many Germans, Wallenstein had become too powerful when he was made Prince of Mecklenburg. Ferdinand had been forced to do this because his war chest was so empty that his only means to pay his generals was land and titles. Many regarded Wallenstein as an upstart that could only bring bad things. 
Eventually, Ferdinand was pressured into releasing him from service. Subsequently, the army, including the forces of the Catholic League, was reformed and put under the Emperor's supreme command, who delegated all affairs to the Imperial Lieutenant General Count of Tilly. In an attempt to decrease the burden the army was putting on the population, it was reduced in size substantially. Some contingents of the Catholic League in Westphalia were cut by more than a third. The remaining men in Westphalia were put under the command of Gottfried Heinrich zu Pappenheim, who replaced Count Anhold in 1630. Pappenheim is usually regarded as a religious zealot. He had converted to Catholicism in 1614 and vowed to suffer a wound for every year he lived as a heretic. He kept his promise. At the Battle of White Mountain in 1620, he was left for dead with dozens of scars, but he survived and was since known as Schrammenheinz, Scarred Heinz. Tilly and Pappenheim each had 12 years of experience in this war alone, commanded a veteran army corps and the best cavalry in the empire. They were not scared of Gustavus at all. At this moment, Gustavus's organization and tactics, though always praised by military historians, had yet to prove itself against a Western European opponent. It had been developed to fight the armies of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. These relied heavily on their superior cavalry that was perfectly adapted to the vast distances and challenging geography of Livonia, Lithuania and Poland. Especially the Hussars were a thorn in the side of the Swedes and repeatedly inflicted heavy losses on them in open field battles. Given the superiority of the Hussars, the Swedes developed very defensive military tactics and relied on infantry, artillery and cavalry working in close support. This is illustrated by the fact that Gustavus had his men dig in to such an extent that the Polish referred to the Swedes as moles. He combined these defensive tactics with insights gained from the Dutch military school that relied on small, maneuverable contingents. Gustavus thinned his lines even more than the Dutch, to six men instead of the Dutch ten. This widened the front line, which maximized firepower and made Swedish formations harder to outflank. By 1631, the infantry was grouped into so-called brigades, which consisted of several smaller units that could operate individually. The musketeers were trained to fire in volleys to maximize the psychological impact of their fire before a charge. Small musketeer contingents were also placed on the flanks to support the cavalry. They were meant to disrupt enemy cavalry charges and to create an opportunity for the Swedish horsemen to countercharge. Still, as the historian Peter Wilson points out, quote, these tactics were largely unproven and the Swedes arrived in Germany having been routed at Stumm, their last major engagement. End quote. Over the course of 1630, it slowly became clear what Gustavus actually wanted in the empire. Shortly after his landing, writers in Germany were liberally paid by the Swedes to argue that the imperial constitution had to be restored to its proper state. Bogislav Philip Chemnitz, better known by his pseudonym Hippolytus Alipide, was one of these writers. He argued the empire should be an aristocracy, with the emperor merely the first among equals. Unsurprisingly, this book was banned and symbolically burned by Ferdinand's hangman. His anecdote illustrates that Gustavus wanted to reduce the emperor's power, especially in northern Germany. For this reason, Sweden championed the so-called German liberties, meaning the rights of German princes to decide themselves on various issues without having to consult the emperor. Keeping Habsburg power at bay was considered equal to creating security, and thus referred to with the Latin term assecuratio, security. According to Peter Wilson, Gustavus wanted, quote, to ensure the emperor was never able to pose a danger again. Swedish security thus lay in revising the imperial constitution to emasculate the emperor and reversing the recent revival of Habsburg power, especially in northern Germany." End quote. Gustavus's second objective was territorial. He wanted to gain a stronger foothold on the German coast and, if possible, to connect them to his recent gains in Poland. The third objective is best summarized by a contemporary's quote. It is better to tie the goat at the neighbor's gate than one's own. This is to say that the Swedes wanted to pay their army with money from Germany because their war chest was empty. They were simply not able to enforce a peace without additional means to pay off their troops. Sweden's first objective, security, paved the way for an alliance with France. France wanted to keep the Habsburgs at bay as well 
and thus signed the Treaty of Bervalde on the 23rd of January in 1631, in which France promised to support Sweden's efforts financially. Gustavus's propaganda really zeroed in on Swedish security and tried to make it look like the fight for German liberties and Protestantism were a just and righteous cause. The only problem was that the Germans didn't want to be freed by him. Most Protestant states refused to follow the Swedes. In fact, at the Leipzig Convention in 1631, the Protestant states, led by John George of Saxony, declared themselves a neutral third party between Gustavus and the Catholic forces. The goal of the German Protestants, stated in the so-called Leipzig Manifesto, was to raise 40,000 men to defend Protestant policy. Recruitment duly began in April of 1631. For most German Protestants, this was simply a means to convince the Emperor to back down on anti-Protestant measures, which had dominated imperial politics since 1629 without having to join a foreign invader. Nonetheless, for a minority, this provided a convenient cover to raise troops to join Sweden once the time was ripe. The pro-Swedish faction included Hessen Kassel, Württemberg, as well as Wilhelm and Bernard of Saxe Weimar. Some of them promptly stopped paying contributions to the Catholic forces and others began evicting imperial garrisons. However, all German Protestants remained cautious and reluctant to side with Gustavus openly until he would prove himself capable of defending them against imperial retribution. Only Christian Wilhelm, the administrator of Magdeburg, declared for Sweden openly. Sweden agreed to an alliance and sent Colonel Falkenberg into the city to help to protect it and ensure the Magdeburgians wouldn't change their minds. This certainly proved necessary as the Imperials were going on the offensive now. In spring of 1631, 25,000 Imperials under Tilly and Pappenheim besieged the city while 7,000 more were raised in Cologne, 8,000 at Fulda and 24,000 were crossing the Alps from Italy. With only 20,000 men in his field army, Gustavus was not going to be able to relieve the city. Instead, he dashed to Frankfurt on the Oder and stormed that city on the 13th of April. This, finally, was Gustavus's first major military success in Germany. However, Tilly did not let himself get distracted from the siege at Magdeburg. He took the outworks and suburbs of the city by mid-May and offered an honorable surrender multiple times, but Falkenberg made sure the city would refuse. On the 20th of May, at a pre-arranged signal, 18,000 Imperial and Liga troops converged on the city from five directions. A company of Croats swam the river Elbe and got into the city through a side gate. Around the same time, a fire broke out in the city and was fanned by strong winds. Until this day, it is not clear what had caused the fire, but it was most likely just an accident. The Imperial commanders surely would have preferred to take the city intact but neither the fire nor the imperial advance on the city could be stopped. Soon, resistance collapsed on the northern front, letting Pappenheim's column in. Once they were in the city, the other sectors collapsed as well. Falkenberg was killed shortly after, and the infamous sack of Magdeburg began. Tilly entered the city and ordered his men to stop plundering, but many were out of control. The inhabitants of Magdeburg tried to barricade themselves in their houses but either the fire or the fury of the soldiers consumed them all. 1,700 out of the 1,900 buildings were destroyed, and 20,000 defenders and citizens died. This disaster became a defining event in the war and set a benchmark for brutality henceforth. At least 205 pamphlets describing the city's fall appeared in 1631 alone, which helped swinging the mood of German Protestants about joining Sweden. While Magdeburg was being stormed and sacked, Gustavus was training his artillery on the palace of the Elector of Brandenburg, George Wilhelm, in Berlin. He still needed more allies, and since they would not join him voluntarily, he resorted to more violent means. The Elector was basically under siege, and had no choice but to agree to Sweden's occupation of Brandenburg and pay war contributions to Gustavus. In this way, the Swedish king secured the support of one of the large German Protestant states. Then, Gustavus moved to Werben, where he wanted to secure the Elbe crossing. There, a first engagement with Tilly took place and the Imperial commander assaulted Gustavus's defensive positions at the crossing. Tilly got the worst of the engagement. 
Casualties numbered around 1,000 for the Imperials and 200 for Sweden. Tilly retreated, but he was soon reinforced by another Catholic commander, Egon of Fürstenberg, who brought his numbers up to 35,000, while another 24,000 were on their way from Italy. The historian Peter Wilson notes, quote, With his army swollen by reinforcements, it was imperative for Tilly to leave the devastated area around Magdeburg and enter fertile Saxony. He pushed on to Leipzig, which surrendered on the 15th of September. End quote. Although Tilly and the Catholics still hoped to reach an agreement with Saxony, the elector had decided to join Sweden instead. This boosted the numbers of Sweden by another 18,000 men. Gustavus and John George of Saxony met at Duben and then marched towards Tilly, who was gathering his men on a broad white plain near the village of Breitenfeld, just outside of Leipzig. Tilly himself commanded the center and drew up the infantry in 12 large blocks, grouped in threes with two battalions posted on either flank to support the cavalry. On the left, Pappenheim commanded about 4,000 horsemen, most of them heavy cuirassiers, including the Pappenheimers, the elite of the Catholic cavalry. On the right, Fürstenberg commanded around 3,100 Liga heavy cavalry, with the Kronberg and Baumgarten regiments being experienced and highly motivated veterans. Another 900 light Croat cavalrymen were put on the extreme right. Meanwhile, it was getting dark. Gustavus and the Saxons had taken position about 5 kilometers north of the battlefield. They had already discovered Tilly's army and were drawn up in battle order when they went to bed. Gustavus was commanding an impressive force of about 40,000 men and was eager for battle. On this fateful evening in September, for the first time in the Thirty Years' War, a Protestant victory seemed realistic. Losing would likely mean the Swedish Protestant cause would be over for good, while victory could shatter the Catholic position of dominance which they'd had for 12 years. It was time for a decisive battle. On the next morning, the Swedes and Saxons crossed the small river Loba and drew up in separate battle arrays. The Swedes were on the right, the infantry brigades and a few reserve cavalry squadrons made up the center of the formation. Gustavus personally led the right wing. Among his horsemen, he placed small platoons of musketeers as fire support. The reserve was commanded by Johann Baneer and the left by Marshal Gustav Horn, the second in command. His side was organized similarly to the right, but with fewer men. Gustavus deliberately kept his own army separate from the inexperienced Saxons who he regarded as unreliable. The Saxons were deployed in a hollow arrowhead formation east of the Duben Leipzig road, with cavalry to their left and right. Around noon, the battle opened with an artillery duel that damaged the Imperials more than the Swedes. About two hours later, both Imperial flanks, the timeline is not 100% known, eventually began moving against the Swedish and Saxon flanks respectively. Pappenheim led his 4,000 heavy cuirassiers against Gustavus' flank and performed the so-called Caraco. This means his men closed into pistol shot distance, shot at the Swedes and then wheeled around to retreat, reload and repeat the process. If an opening was created, this would allow them to charge with sabers. But they never had the time for that, because just after the Imperials had emptied their pieces, the Swedish cuirassiers and musketeers answered with one thunderous volley. Then, the Swedish cavalry countercharged through the thick gun smoke, attacking the Imperial cavalry with sabers and firing additional pistols from melee range. After a quick strike, they retreated, making room from the Swedish musketeers, who had reloaded in the meantime and now poured another volley into the rows of Pappenheim's men, who were in the process of circling back to initiate the next round of the caracol. On the other side of the battlefield, Fürstenberg led his cavalry against the Saxon flank engaging them near the Saxon gun line with his mounted arquebusiers while threatening the Saxon flank with his cuirassiers. The light Croat cavalry was sent to wheel around the Saxon flank. Despite being shaken by the Imperial bombardment and having little battlefield experience, the Saxons held their ground. Around 2.30 pm, when Fürstenberg made contact, Tilly ordered his infantry on the right and the cavalry reserve to advance. They started moving around the Swedish formation to crush the Saxons. Tilly knew just as well as Gustavus that the Saxons were the weak link in the Swedish-Saxon formation. In order to keep his front line intact all the way to Pappenheim, 
Tilly had to stretch out his remaining battalions. In the meantime, Pappenheim was moving ever more to the left in an attempt to outflank the Swedes. He had only left one infantry battalion and two mounted Arquebusier regiments, who already had to act as a hinge to Tilly's line. But the Swedes simply remained in their defensive formation, meeting Pappenheim's charges with volley fire and counter charges, while bit by bit feeding in the cavalry reserve under Johann von Ehr. Meanwhile, most Imperial troops had engaged in a musketry and artillery duel with the Swedish infantry in the center. Around 3 p.m., two of Fürstenberg's veteran regiments, Baumgarten and Kromberg, found an opportunity to charge into the Saxon formation. Baumgarten's men rode by and fired their pistols, but Kronberg's charged the Saxons with sabers in hand. The inexperienced Saxons, shaken by the artillery bombardment and threatened by the Croats on their left, simply disintegrated when their gentry levies took to their heels. Cavalry and commanders soon joined the rout. Only two veteran Saxon cavalry regiments remained on the field and joined Horn's Swedish left flank. With the Saxons fleeing, Tilly could now envelop the Swedish left flank. But by 3 p.m. the gun smoke and the dust, stirred up by thousands of feet and hoofs, made it difficult to see what was happening. The Imperial right probably thought they had already won, and many chased the fleeing Saxons. Consequently, Fürstenberg had problems keeping his men together. Only around 3.30 to 4 p.m. was Tilly's right ready to attack. This gave Gustav Horn the time to move the Swedish reserve to the right and pivot his entire flank at a 90-degree angle along the Düben-Leipzig road to present a new defensive position. According to the eyewitness Lieutenant Colonel Maschamp, the Swedish regimental artillery pieces, another of Gustavus's innovations, were in place by then and greeted the approaching Imperials. Right before impact, the musketeers joined in and together they fired a deafening volley. The fight quickly became a messy melee, with muskets being used as clubs. At around 4 pm, while the fight was raging on the entire front line, on the Imperial left flank, Pappenheim launched his seventh charge. And for the seventh time he was repelled. His men and horses were exhausted, disorganized and spread out along the Swedish flank. Likewise, the infantry battalion and mounted arquebusiers, who were covering the area between Pappenheim and the center, had been taking fire from the Swedes for over an hour. Gustavus realized there was an opening to decide the battle. At 4.15, he made his move. He had Bonaire's men charge Pappenheim's left flank, while two other Swedish reserve cavalry regiments burst forward against Pappenheim's inner right flank. Another two Swedish cavalry units charged the Imperial Arquebusier regiments and the infantry group respectively. The lines of Pappenheim's cuirassiers simply crumbled under the attack of these fresh troops committed to a flat-out charge. The Imperial Arquebusiers, caught on the wrong foot, ran for their lives. Only the infantry group formed a ring of pikes and stood its ground. Around the same time, the infantry fight on Horn's flank came to an end because the Imperial commander was shot by a musketeer. Horn had his cavalry burst forward and charged the Imperial Reserve Cavalry opposite them. Here too, the Imperials were driven back and soon cracked under the pressure. By now, most of Gustavus's men on the right were chasing Pappenheim's fleeing cavalry. But he still had some cavalry regiments left, among them the feared Finns. Under his personal command, they began to roll up what was left of the Imperial center while Tilly was escorted off the field after he had been shot in the arm. Some of the Imperial infantry managed to retreat to the Linkelwald around 6 pm and made a desperate last stand there. This probably allowed others to flee. The Imperials' situation was hopeless. Gustavus and Horn had conquered both the Saxon and Imperial artillery and began to bombard the remaining Imperials at the Linkelwald. The Battle of Breitenfeld was the major victory Gustavus direly needed. While he had been regarded as a foreign king in the empire before that, Protestant propagandists now quickly turned him into the savior of Protestantism in Germany. They called for a general call to arms, citing the victory at Breitenfeld as divine retribution for the horrific sack of Magdeburg. Meanwhile, Tilly moved westwards through Westphalia, then south across Hessen into Franconia, where he joined up with the remaining Catholic reinforcements replenishing his army to 40,000 men. 
In addition, 20,000 more Imperials were gathering in Silesia, and some were still on their way from Italy. It was already the end of September, and military campaigns would have to be paused until spring. Direct pursuit was not an option for Gustavus. In the end, he decided to march southwest through Thuringia to seize as much land as possible before winter closed in. This would put him close to his allies in Württemberg and Hessen Castle, and also allowed him to threaten Bavaria. For the first time in the war, the Catholics were truly under pressure. Thanks again to Enlisted for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to get your free bonus pack for Enlisted by using our link in the description below. See you on the battlefield. Our videos take a lot of time to research and animate, so if you enjoy our content, please consider donating via Patreon.